Good morning, everyone. If you agree, we could start the session. Uh, I happen to have a double role in this session. I'm the chair and also the first paper giver. Uh, let me introduce myself very shortly. I'm Lavo Shonkoy. I'm a historian dealing with cultural heritage and the relationship between history and cultural heritage for 15 years or so. Uh, and I teach at the University of Budapest. And as you can see on the on the table, we have five papers this morning, all five around the, the, about the topic of history of urban landscape, which is a very problematic uh, topic. And we can discuss it from five different angles, from different countries. Uh, actually, Hungary is a bit overrepresented because three papers givers out of uh, five are from Hungary. But we also have uh, Syria, Italy, and Poland uh, uh, among the, the panelists. Uh, the panel will be 20 minutes per each uh, lecture. Then we'll have a very short time for technical questions and a general debate at the end of the session. And altogether, we have two hours and 30 minutes. Uh, so I think without further ado, uh, I will start to uh, give my paper, which is a theoretical one, and then I will give the floor successively, and the paper giver will always sit here. So please, paper giver, sit here, okay? And of course, I will rotate, so I will go there. Uh, just a moment, I have to find my presentation. So now me as a paper giver, <laughs> you see me as a chair. Um, I'd like to talk about the meaning of historic urban landscape. As you know, this is a term uh, which was first used by UNESCO and ECOMOS. Uh, actually, we can celebrate its 10th anniversary because the term itself was first worded in, in 2005 in Vienna. And of course, it's a very complex term, and we only have 20 minutes to discuss it. So I would like to first uh, see whatever the term means through its main, three main components. Time, culture, and urban planning. How this term itself can be interpreted uh, by these three uh, important ingredients. And after that, uh, the second question is a historian. I'd like to ask the question, how to use this term? So, in order to that, first uh, I'd like to sh show briefly why this notion came to youth, what was the reason for the birth of this notion, after that, what are the internal contradictions within the term, and then I would like to put emphasis on one aspect, the security. That's why I gave the title, Encoded Security. I think security is a crucial term, of course, not just in the preservation of uh, uh, cultural heritage or monuments, but in general. I think in our period, all the discussions about uh, uh, current uh, social uh, uh, problems are about security. How, can, how we can maintain, how we can keep security. And after that, just the conclusion, the static and dynamic notions of cultural heritage protections and the different notions of security. Because I think within the term of historic urban landscape, we can see a very serious conflict, professional conflict, uh, between um, heritage, cultural heritage preservers, experts, professionals, which comes from the difference how they define and uh, security itself. So the first question is, uh, how, uh, how we can understand our own period? This is more theoretical, but I think it's a very important notion. So we shouldn't forget the fact that cultural heritage is a notion of the second half of the 20th century. Of course, anyone can argue that we already have cultural heritage in the, in the French Revolution, etc., etc. But my point is, cultural heritage became important in the second half of the 20th century, though it has some, of course, prehistory, especially in English and in French. 
Uh, and I think what we use by cultural heritage uh, in every languages except for French and English is a translation from an international term mainly coming from uh, international organizations like the UNESCO. Of course, every country has a history of monument protection, but monument doesn't necessarily mean cultural heritage. So, uh, even if we can argue that cultural heritage is uh, older, you can say it, but we, we, we should agree that it became institutionalized and important and an all-encompassing term uh, from the 1970s, 60s and 70s onwards. And actually, this is the period, not uh, accidentally, when uh, there was a general decline or a credibility uh, loss in modernization. So as much as cultural heritage was becoming more and more popular, uh, modernization was less and less popular. So of course, there were several attempts to pin down the, uh, the, the period or to find a definition for the period from the 1960s onwards, we couldn't really find a proper term except for a negative one. Uh, what is our period is characteristic of? So many in the, in the 70s, 80s, uh, there was many debates what is postmodern. Postmodern was a catch term, we don't use it anymore because postmodern didn't give any positive identity except it showed that there's something after the modernization. So, if we want to understand cultural heritage and its popularity, uh, we have to understand uh, so the context from the 1970s onwards, which could, could, could give us an identity. One of the terms I like to use is uh, a French philosopher and historian, uh, François Artaud's term, who, who talks about presentism. What is presentism, very briefly? Uh, uh, Artok says that each period can be uh, characterized by its relationship to time. And of course time has three main aspects, past, present and future. Traditional societies, which is up to 1980s, if, you're uh, if you have some historical background, it's uh, Reinhard Kozelek's model also. Up to the 1980s, traditional societies are based on the past. The main reference is the past. Modernization changes it uh, drastically, uh, especially from the 19th century, when instead of past, future becomes the main aspect. Everything is about future, it's planning, it's utopia. Whereas all these questions about uh, the valid validity of modernization are becoming so numerous that from the 1970s we can talk about the new period, when instead of the more fearful future, we, uh, there's a tendency to go back to the past, but of course we cut, Europeans cut themselves from the past, so present becomes the more important, actually breaking, uh, breaking the, uh, the development. So that's the meaning of presentism. Of course it's, it could be a long debate on itself, but just to, to sum it up briefly, so there's a credit loss in the ideologies of the 19th century, <coughs> which were supposed to tell how the future should be, communism, socialism, liberalism, etc. Uh, there's an epistemological failing of determinism. It's very difficult to plan the future anymore. And uh, of course, there's a fear of future, catastrophes, immigration, new love, you know, you can name it, environmental uh, risk, etc., etc. So, uh, to understand historic urban landscape and uh, cultural heritage, the importance of cultural heritage, I think presentism is a very useful term. Second big question is culture. Uh, how the notion of culture changed after the Second World War? Of course, it's another, uh, it will be another year of the university lecture to discuss what I tried to put into two minutes. But of course, the culture of the, uh, how UNESCO understood it, it's a Franco-Anglo-US consensus. It's not the general consensus, it's the, it's the meaning of culture of the winners after the Second World War. And of course, UNESCO in the beginning was created to, uh, was established to create a common human culture, and this quest was only in the 1940s and, uh, in the, in 1940s and 50s, the latest house actually, uh, on the demand of the UNESCO, wrote his first book, Race and History, claiming that it's impossible to create a common human culture. So there was the period of hesitation in the 60s and the 70s, and Lady Strauss wrote his second, actually, big uh, publication, 
and gave a, delivered a lecture at the UNESCO, when he said that it's not just impossible to create a common human culture, which was the raison d'etre of the UNESCO, but it's, imp uh, it's not just impossible, but it's not necessary, and it's even uh, dangerous to, for such a claim. So, and actually this is the same period, this hesitation, the 60s and the 70s, when UNESCO is looking for new terms and it didn't happen by accident and this is the moment when the Convention of Cultural Heritage is signed in 1972. And actually with cultural heritage, a new term is encoded, which is cultural diversity, which comes into use from the 1920s and uh, has uh, and becomes actually a standard setting term, 2001 Cultural Diversity Universal Declaration and the Convention in 2005. We all know this story, but what is interesting to pin down here, that cultural diversity becomes as crucial for humankind, this is a quotation from the, from the declaration in 2001, uh, as biodiversity for nature. So actually, with this keeping of diversity, of course, will be crucial for security. And of course, by the expansion of cultural heritage from the 1970s onwards, concerning the city, we see how there is a shift or expansion from the monument to the city, from tangible to intangible, and of course, all these expansions raise hundreds of questions of universality <coughs> and authenticity, the two basic concepts of uh, universal uh, heritage or world heritage. Third main axis we have to take into consideration, and of course it's very, it's overall simplified, the, the nature of urban planning, how it changed in the 19th century. Urban planning as we knew, of course it's modernist, a future based, and its establishment in the 19th century, the main idea between urban planning that we can create an ideal society by creating an ideal urban environment, built environment, and of course, as we all know the history of urban planning, there's also always a social ideology behind it. But each generation expressed its uh, discontent concerning the, pre the achievements of the previous generations, so from the 1970s onwards, there's a general uh, hesitation or a credibility loss also in urban planning, uh, which means that first, there are no more credible social ideologies which can help to, to forming the new urban environment. And uh, so instead of the social ideology, identity or the myth of participation takes place. And uh, so urban planning as such is shifting more and more from this idealistic utopian approach to a more practical and more identity-based approach. And of course, identity itself raises millions of questions. So if we want to understand why historic urban landscape as a term came to use, we have to take into consideration presentism, uh, the new notion of culture, culture as a, a maintainer of security through diversity, and of course the changes in urban planning. Uh, I just want to shift uh, very quickly, run through the, 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 the birth of historic urban landscape. As you know, it was first defined in 2005, actually to solve the problem of visual integrity. And this is a key term, visual integrity, because this is the moment when UNESCO starts uh, using, applying the term visual integrity without giving any proper definition, whatever they mean by visual integrity. Of course, there are several ideas, but there is no uh, definite definition. Even now, uh, the, the, the defining process is going on. Uh, after 2005, there's a recommendation in 2011, and uh, actually for those, the masterminds of the historic urban landscape, they consider this as a new paradigm of urban planning. But historic and urban is fine, but the question can be raised, where, why landscape? Why not area, why not territory, why, why landscape? And for that, I made a conceptual analysis of the standard setting instruments of the UNESCO and ICOMOS from the Venice Charter 64 up to this 2011 UNESCO recommendation on historic urban landscape. 
And of course, don't be afraid, I'm not going into details because we don't have time, unfortunately, for this. But of course, this, this analysis couldn't be done without the structure. And for the structure, I turned to Michel Foucault, who, when analyzing the uh, absolute state and giving a new identity, a top-down new identity, put emphasis on three notions. How the state created territory, population, and security. And very interesting how, if we try to trace back the definition of urban territory, urban community, and temporality, presentism, or security, in the standard setting, uh, standard setting uh, instruments of the UNESCO and the e-commerce, it's very interesting to see how these three terms, urban territory, community, and temporality, are changing, and how we arrive at the definition of historic urban landscape. So the second part of my lecture, I'd like to uh, analyze this, how these three terms are changing in the last 50 years for UNESCO and e-commerce. Uh, but for that, first we have to see why in Vienna, and why, why there was a necessity to create a new term to analyze the management of cultural heritage in an urban setting. So we all know that the word heritage list was expanding from 1978 when the first 22 uh, sites were on the list. It became huge by 2005. They, there were already more than 300 urban sites on the world heritage list. So some instruments, means were needed to be able to manage this huge amount of cities. So 19, in the 90s, there was a process when these world heritage cities uh, got some identity or tried to express themselves uh, as, as, as a unity. So there was an identity construction process. At the same time, the UNESCO wanted to create some uh, means also to check the unwanted development in this city. And they invented the danger list the list of endangered cities, and actually it was Vienna, which was accepted as a World Heritage in 2001, that immediately got on the, the list of endangered lists because of a construction of a high-rise building in uh, one year later. And of course Vienna, which was traditionally an international city and one of the headquarters of UNESCO, I mean the UN, sorry, simply couldn't allow afford to be delisted right after the listing, right? So, and of course Vienna has another a story, uh, a history of, of social care and, um, and, and uh, as an international city, etc., etc. I'm not going into details, but during these negotiations between Vienna and UNESCO, actually the idea of a, of a new standard setting instrument and notion came into use. And it was not only, it's very interesting that it was mainly German-speaking cities which were uh, the bad examples in the, in the early 2000s. Vienna, Cologne, and Dresden. Dresden, as we all know, the only European World Heritage uh, site so far which was finally listed. And of course, later Liverpool, which is still on the list of endangered sites. So, somehow, German-speaking and, and the problem of uh, historic uh, urban uh, conservation was linked together in the, two th in the early 2000s. And actually, there were, I was talking about the two masterminds who actually uh, worded between Austrian colleagues the first historic urban landscape recommendation, or the Vienna Memorandum. It was Francesco Bandarin and Ron van Erz, two architects, but both were kind of important in the 2000s, but not really important in the 2010s after a while. Roman Arts even uh, recently died, unfortunately, in Tibet. So anyway, but uh, the term itself was worded and became a kind of means, but maybe not the unifying means to, to, to deal with historic cities as it was expected around 2005. 
So uh, I don't think we should spend much time on the historic urban landscape itself because it's a well-known concept. But if we put the what what is said in I'm sorry. yes what is said in the first volume and what is uh, of the historic urban landscape there's a second one more recently and in the in, and in, in the UNESCO text we can see there are some internal uh, conflict within the term, which is, did it happen by chance? Because the historic urban landscape wants to solve, at the same time, urban conservation and urban development. So it's modernist and presentist at the same time. It identifies as itself as a utopia, but it's a presentist or a, a utopia, so it has a, it, it's planning the future in the name of sustainability without having a clear ide ideology what the future should be. That's, uh, it talks about urban development, it sees urban development as a necessity, and it wants to answer the problems of global economy and mass tourism. So in a way, it's a standard setting, so it's top down. At the same time, it's post and anti modernist. It puts emphasis on, of course, the intangible urban heritage aspect. So its traditional knowledge transfer is important. Local stability and, of course, uh, participation. So it's bottom-up at the same time. So it didn't happen by chance because most of the term, uh, crucial terms of, uh, his, of uh, presentism, just like historic urban landscape, are very loose. They are not academic terms anymore. There is no more expectation to, to be clear-cut. And historic urban landscape uh, satisfies this demand of presentism totally. Uh, and actually, to solve these problems, these uh, theoretical or philosophical problems within the, uh, uh, the, the term itself, it has a new concept of the city or the urban uh, uh, setting. It's sustainable, it's dynamic, it's, uh, it sees the society as a community, and the territory and the time is continuous. It's very important. It's not the old, new distinction anymore. Everything is continuous, be meaning that anything can become heritage. Industrial, uh, uh, communist, whatever, can, be, can become heritage. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just running out of time. But very much. So this is the, uh, the, that's how one can summarize the, the new heritage city according to the historic urban landscape uh, paradigm. And just to finish uh, my lecture, I'd like to insist on, uh, oops, on the, uh, the security part. Because security uh, for the historic urban landscape is, uh, sorry, yeah, the main, main uh, my point is, historic urban landscape didn't become the general uh, means of solving the problems of heritage cities in the last 10 years as it was expected. Why? Because it didn't find the expectations of UNESCO professionals, and I'm even being provo provocative here. Uh, if we, I analyzed a bit, those cities which were included or mentioned in the problem of Vienna. Vienna, as I said before, was on the danger list, and after that it was taken out of the danger list, and, I, and after that it was again and again accused of being, not respecting the visual integrity of the cultural heritage. And during this process, they mention also neighboring cities, Salzburg, Graz, Budapest, Prague, Cologne, and Dresden. If we see these seven cities, we can see that heritage, world heritage cities, go on a roller coaster of being threatened and unthreatened. So actually, visual integrity for them being, is a constant threat. If you see in the last 10 years, all these seven cities were regularly accused on not uh, respecting visual integrity. But the question, oops, I'm sorry, sorry. 
The question can be raised, how can we define visual integrity? Very in, interesting enough, enough, two or three years after the, the Vienna Memorandum, which was also one of the recommendations, uh, uh, as a solution for visual integrity, historic urban landscape was always cited. After 2007, it's not really mentioned anymore in the analysis of threats of world heritage cities. World, historic urban landscape goes on its own. There's books published on it, there are conferences, but not really used by the UNESCO on the administrative level. So, and 2011, of course we all know the recommendation on historic urban landscape, it's a standard setting instrument. At the same time, there's the volatile principles of the e-commerce. If we compare the two texts, they are just the opposite. The volatile principles of safeguarding and management of historic cities takes, uh, considers the city as tangible heritage. It's a very monumentalist approach, it's a very static approach. Whereas, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the historic urban landscape is more dynamic. So actually, and visual integrity on its own becomes like the main question when threats, urban threats are mentioned. So at the same time, or now, 2015, in our period, I think we have two competing notions treating cultural heritage. One is the visual integrity on its own, and it's not the visual integrity which is involved in the historic urban landscape. And this is the good old monument, monumentalist approach, which has a new concept of, of the unity or the continuity of the territory of the historic city. Whereas there's the historic urban landscape, which is much more, which is much more loose. It's a landscape but at the same time tries to integrate uh, uh, other aspects like the intangible into the notion of history, uh, of, of, uh, history uh, of the historic uh, city or the heritage city. And because there are different professional interests between the two notions, they are in a hidden competition right now. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, actually, the, the idea was that we, we should have a little conversation or questions, technical questions, after each uh, lecture or paper. Then we will have a general discussion at the end. So, I'm chairing myself, so if you have any <laughs> technical questions to me right now, I'm happy to answer. And at the same time, I'd like to ask our next paper givers uh, to... Uh, to Bear in mind that they will be the next ones. <laughs> so you have, do you have any questions? If you don't have that questions, then don't feel bad because we'll have time at the end. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So, uh, so now we have two uh, paper givers from uh, La Sapienza University of Rome. It's Aisha Darvish and Daniela Esposito. Are you going to talk to both of you? Uh, I will talk uh, on your own. Yes. Okay. So, Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. I try to be to show you a few minutes. Okay. It's a very good example. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Haisha Dalvich. I'm going to speak uh, on the part of myself and uh, my professor Daniela Esposito. Uh, so we uh, uh, work about the, the reconstruction of the urban gaps in history centers destroyed by warfare and. Uh, uh, with examples from Poland, uh, we tried to integrate <coughs> this in the, in the um, comprehensive subject of uh, history of urban landscape. So, I'm going to, to, to speak about these examples as, um, as historic cities and as uh, an important, each one as an important part of the general historic urban landscape of the whole city. So, uh, starting with a general uh, introduction uh, about the research, uh, as, as we all of us uh, know that uh, Poland was uh, subject of uh, 
a vast devastation, uh, destruction uh, during the Second World War, which created um, a lot of urban gaps and uh, which are still existing till uh, these days. Uh, uh, as we see in some cities like Gdansk or Elblon or other cities, uh, gaps which are still subject to reconstruction process. Uh, so the, the, the main question is what makes a good urban integrated intervention in a Polish historic center from the point of view of the conservation discipline? And uh, we are going to discuss this issue starting from Gdansk, which uh, was destroyed to a large proportion during the Second World War. As we see here, the clearest parts in clear grey are uh, the completely destructed uh, parts, with the black points as intact buildings. And then uh, the, the, the city, the historic city was registered uh, directly after, uh, in, in the post-war period, uh, as we see with the, these um, red borders, which represent the medieval city, and with the central part representing the most, uh, we can see, protected part, you know, and, uh, which, was, which has uh, been the subject of the reconstruction process <coughs> directly from the post-war period. Uh, some points to be considered concerning these examples. First of all, the system of relationship between buildings and open spaces. Uh, second, the system of built volumes, the facade system, the relationship between monumental architecture and vernacular urban fabric, and last, the layout system, which means the, from the interior, what is it? Is it modern or is it uh, reconstructed in the same way uh, as uh, was the case in the pre-war uh, period? Um, after an, a, a, just uh, after just a quick survey of uh, these cities, uh, which are Gdansk, Grotzkap, and uh, and Erdlong, which I visited personally, uh, we we can um, make uh, a catalog like categories of interventions made in these cities. Uh, we can divide this in intervention. Uh, with the historic fabric itself, and then intervention within the historic fabric, but in the vicinity of a historic monument, intervention within the area subject to urban renewal, even in the registered historic city, and intervention within these uh, areas, but in the vicinity of a historic monument, and at, la at, uh, at last, uh, interventions in the junction areas between the historic fabric and the Area, uh, area subject to urban renewal project. So, uh, always starting uh, with the task, we can see the, the first example representing uh, the intervention within the history fabric. It's an example in the granary uh, ISO uh, in Gdansk uh, uh, at the north of the um, Stagierne Street, uh, which uh, which was uh, reconstructed as it was uh, uh, in the pre-war situation, but from the exterior aspect. So we can see Comera e Dovera in, in the Italian term. And we can compare between how was it before the war and how is it now. Uh, by, um, in, in fact, they, um, during the reconstruction, they uh, created a common central uh, open space inside the block, the urban block, to create, uh, to, to, um, to allow light, uh, natural light, to enter in, the, uh, in all the buildings. So to satisfy new or contemporary needs. Another example is um, <coughs> the block was to uh, Jaska Street. I don't know if I can read <laughs> in the right way uh, the Polish language, but I, I try. So uh, it's an example which was reconstructed in a historical style, but uh, we can say that uh, 
the positive uh, aspect is that uh, there is a respect for the heights uh, of the buildings, but we cannot see the same intonation in the original openings as it was uh, as it is in the historic fabric. So we can see all the openings on the same line, and um, which is different from the uh, urban context. And uh, shifting to the third example, uh, always we are uh, in, with the intervention within the historic fabric. This example, uh, this example represents um, an, in a modern intervention, uh, which is um, still under, under uh, reconstruction, we can say. It is in this part of the city, at the north of the St. Mary's Church, and this is the situation during uh, after the war destruction. And this is how it looks like uh, last year, in 2014. So um, there is a, there is a, they um, try to there is a try to uh, to represent uh, um, to respect. The, uh, the original uh, division of the facade, the, uh, the original uh, module of the facade, the original heights of the facade, of the built volumes, with new, with modern architecture. But maybe there is another aspect to be discussed uh, in a deeper uh, uh, way, uh, like the, 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 the architectural vocabulary, etc. But uh, some respect we can feel uh, through this example of the <coughs> history of urban context. Uh, now we can see an, another example, the crane. The crane and the maritime cultural center adjacent to it. Um, it's a famous building, historical monument in Gdansk. Um, and uh, it, this was the, the situation after the war destruction. And then nowadays we can see the train with the adjacent uh, maritime cultural cultural center, um, which uh, respect to some extent also the heights and the division of the uh, facades of the original context in a modern language. So, in fact, every example we can speak a lot about every example, but I try to to summarize it to the minimum during this. Um, intervention because maybe in the article it will be detailed more more and more and um, this a second uh, type of interventions is within the historic fabric and near a historical monument like uh, for example near the vicinity of the church of saint mary in Gdansk. Uh, here um, the, the reconstruction process or the destruction of the war was taken as an opportunity to rearrange the space around the, the church in relatively a positive way. So they tried to, to, to create some space around this huge monument. For example, we can see here the situation before, uh, in the pre-war period. Uh, this block, for example, they didn't reconstruct because um, they wanted to create a little bit to, to uh, the space about uh, around the, the monument itself. So they re they reconstructed some parts and um, they um, made use of uh, of the new spaces uh, to create uh, a little bit open spaces around the, this monument. This is an open space with garden with the walking uh, space, etc. So. Uh, a third uh, type of intervention is within the, the, the areas subject to urban renewal. As we said, uh, as we saw in uh, the plan of the city, there was the, the big um, registered zone with the central zone mo the most protected, but the other zones within the historic city are subject to urban renewal projects. We can see a mosaic of examples. In fact, for example, we can see a little bit high architecture with uh, also another, uh, uh, other examples of more harmonious architecture with more respectful uh, heights, with more resp respectful modules, etc. So I wanted to, uh, to, um, to, to uh, demonstrate 
these two examples as representative to other uh, interventions, uh, other similar interventions in these uh, areas. Um, other in type of intervention is um, also in the East Area subject to renewal uh, projects, but uh, also in the vicinity of uh, historical monuments. Like, for example, uh, I don't know, most of you maybe know, know about uh, the commercial center of Madison in Gdansk. Uh, near it, there, is, uh, there are two towers, and behind uh, one of these towers, we discovered that there is a historical monument. Uh, it, it's um, a church with, um, as we can see a little bit, uh, the heights here dominate uh, the cityscape and um, also in, um, with, architectural, with architectural aspect a little bit, um, we can see which need more discussion and more uh, reflection about it. Um, the fifth point or the fifth uh, category is the, um, the interventions in the junction areas between the historic fabric and the renewal uh, or the, the, the areas uh, subject to renewal projects. For example, we can mention the example of uh, the theater of Shakespeare in, in the city just near on the border of the historic zone which exists here, we can see the, the theater <coughs> is here. Um, maybe we can discuss a lot about the scale of the building, the form of the building, the color. So I just want to mention it as an example for discussion, maybe later, maybe in the article, etc. And to, to, to open the, um, um, how to say, to to promote a question about this type of intervention, not just inside the historical, the most historical core, but also beside it or in the vicinity of the uh, of this type of zones. Um, other point uh, um, we want to, to, to focus uh, on is uh, the the ma uh, making use of uh, these gaps for creating new green spaces uh, in the periphery of the uh, historical, the most historical zones, for example, here in the north, here and here. So, and also, in, uh, especially here, the, the, the new roads, the new, um, uh, the most modern, Parts of this, of the, as uh, we can say, parts of buffer zone. Um, for the city of Rotsbach, um, this uh, slide demonstrates the destruction of the Second World War, which is concentrated in the black zones. Uh, this zone is um, less uh, uh, destructed. And then the same uh, points to be considered, uh, as we mentioned for Gdansk, uh, for the organophology of the historic fabric, and uh, the, cat the categories of the interventions are the same. So uh, an example of the intervention uh, of, uh, inside the historic fa fabric is an example of Comera e Dovera, uh, reconstructing a building as it was before, War. So this is an example. This is the building number 41 in the Rinek in Wrocław. Another example is a whole block uh, at the north part of the historic city. Um, it was reconstructed in the years 90s. Um, um, in a modern, it, it is half a block in fact, because we see this block, we have this half which was reconstructed uh, totally in this way, in a modern uh, <coughs> architecture uh, which try to respect the urban context and uh, with a more modern language we can see another example, for example, in the street of, um, I will try to, to, to read the name correctly, Pavla Vodkovitska. <laughs> So uh, this example, with another example which um, 
we can see maybe another quote, I don't know. So uh, there is a try to respect the, the general height of the context. With the modern architecture, in a gap already existed. Uh, also before war, I will pass quickly for other, for other examples. Uh, because it's the same methodology as in Gdansk to come to the conclusion. So, now I want just also to mention Elblanc as a, as a case of reconstruction with an integrated reconstruction plan. Because as you know, uh, Elblanc was left as a park after, uh, in the post-war period for uh, 50 years. And then in the years 70s, they started to reconstruct this city by uh, setting uh, an, a comprehensive reconstruction plan. And there's um, a famous person, I can mention the known, Maria Lubov Kahofman, who was uh, behind this initiative to, to create this plan and to create it in a way respectful to the original morpho urban morphology, in fact, as we can see here from the pre-war situation, and here the, um, the, the, the master plan. This, this is what is realized till this moment. You can see here, and also uh, in the photo, examples in the same. We can see in Elblanc a very modern architecture, but respecting the, the road network <coughs> and the urban curb divisions, but the very modern vocabularies, we can discuss also more about this issue. Uh, I will come to the, to the conclusion. Um, uh, as a conclusion, um, it's more, um, first of all, uh, it will be more efficient and more conservative of the identity of the city to, uh, to emphasize the maintaining and the revitalization of the authentic features of the urban morphology of the historic uh, city. And this would foster the historic urban landscape of the city. And we saw this through some integration and reintegration, because um, we say integration when it's an already existing gap in the, uh, in the, in the urban fabric, and reintegration when we reconstruct uh, a gap which was caused by an event, uh, warfare, or etc. So um, we saw this through these interventions in the three examples of Elda, Dusk, and uh, Protva, which represent other Polish historic cities, in fact. And essentially, this was through maintaining the road network, the original plot divisions, even slightly modified to satisfy contemporary needs. And the uh, second point is um, it uh, could be the respect uh, of the system of the built volume, especially through the heights and the silhouette of the facades, even by creating modern architecture when inserted in the historic urban landscape, as we saw um, in, with some examples in uh, the three uh, cities. And um, even in, within the historic fabric or in the vicinity of the historic fabric. And uh, I want to emphasize uh, the concept of uh, not only the urban restoration, but uh, also the reintegration of uh, the gaps created by warfare, for, for example. But also uh, the question of the gaps already present in the original urban fabric. Here, um, new integrated intervention can be inserted correctly to be harmonious with the historic context, creating um, a dialogue between the modern architecture and uh, the historic architecture. Uh, one thing remains that the question of paying attention that while treating the question of filling a gap uh, in uh, the urban fabric, um, not only to uh, create, uh, not only to, to, to fill the gap, and, but to pay attention but to recreate a new gap, a new visual gap, uh, and uh, in the sense of uh, the visual integration, as we say in the concept of the urban landscape, and um, uh, or to we have to pay attention.
intention not to bring uh, in the background the, uh, the historic architecture, which uh, by, by posing a very, uh, uh, we can see by posing the an exaggerated modern architecture. And um, I can see this is uh, the main points which I want, uh, which I would like to, to, to mention. And uh, I'm sure a lot of things to be discussed in this uh, issue. So I try to summarize to the minimum uh, the issue of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any technical questions? Yes, please. In your perspective, uh, what kind of arguments do you use to justify reconstruction in a historic city? And because uh, for many people it can be perceived as a falsification of historic public. You know what I mean? What kind of argument should be used to justify a decision for reconstruction? Mm. Because uh, I know many people who argue that this is a process of falsification of city, of a historic yeah. city. Yes, the question is uh, remains open because uh, there is um, several points of view about the reconstruction. Mm, and uh, we cannot say that there is a fixed theory about this. But there is, um, because maybe somebody say, uh, see an example well integrated, somebody not. So it's a relative point of view. But uh, um, in general, I think that a typological process should be made for integration. A typological process means not to use the same model but to use the type, even with modern vocabulary, with modern architecture. So you can use uh, the typology, uh, the typological methodology with modern architecture or with an architecture um, more, uh, more ha how to say, more historical or more uh, approaching the historical style. So, the question is always open, and, uh, and and also we can say that it's case by case also. We can discuss it case by case. Yeah, that it takes us to the next problem about uh, developing appropriate uh, design guidelines for, a, let's say, development for yeah. the kind of yeah. site which you presented. So what would be the conditions for this kind of this in terms of, I don't know, building materials, form. Oh. These are usually questioned by you know, planners and architects and, well, obviously, heritage logistics. Uh, it uh, starts by the urban planning, as we say, uh, as we saw with the concept of the historic urban landscape. So, on the scale of the whole city, not all, not not just the the, the historical core. So. Um, since uh, when you respect the whole structure of the city, then you came to the details, and then you came to case part by case to, to define uh, issues related to materials, to heights, to uh, to uh, to every vocabulary in this urban morphology. So um, that is the principal thing to be respected. And then going in the details, you have to see case by case. Yeah, it's a very open yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm like you, I'm, because I'm searching, I'm still in research in this topic. So I'm still, I, I feel always, I have to read more, I have to read more. I didn't uh, reach my, I have to read more. So it's really an open question. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a very philosophical question. Really. Yeah. But, uh, from my perspective, it's open down to the local community as well. Because at the end of the day, it can be for their benefit, really. And they can be the kind of main energy which is pushing for reconstruction due to their kind of common memory of the place. Um, yes. But as I say, you know, I know many people who 
believe that it's, it's a bad practice. Uh, a respect should be um, done for for the, the identity of the, the of the place, and also, but a balance should be created between the contemporary needs, the contemporary current of modernization, of globalization, as we said, and maintaining this identity of the city. So, in fact, it's a conflict. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, we went to more like a conceptual question, and your questions are really relevant. But I th we'll, we'll have time, hopefully, at the end of the whole session. Yeah. So if you don't mind, we will also go with further our, on. Uh, yes, yeah, probably after so. having our interventions. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. So thank you so much for your you uh, paper once more. Thank you. And, uh, if I'm right, we'll have some 30, 40 minutes at the end to discuss conceptual and theoretical uh, questions in more in detail. But so I'd like to switch now for the third paper, and it's by uh, Anna Arnold, who's architect by formation, and worked decades in uh, monumental cultural heritage conservation and protection. And as you can see, he's from Budapest. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I thank very much for being here because I like the place very much, and. Uh, Secondly, I'm very satisfied with this place. I hope that you can enjoy my pictures, my photographs. As a matter of fact, I'm an architect speaking about architecture, but for me, the pictures can be more important. So I will give you a slideshow and I will uh, read only the subtitles. So uh, my topic is new architecture in historic context. Uh, there is a need and even a right for everybody and every group of people to have their local environment developed to improve their quality of life. On the other hand, the contrary also was true. To keep the surroundings unchanged, to leave their memories intact, not to disturb their recall. Because these opposing demands create a conflict if a new building is to be built in a historical context. The question is how to solve this conflict. What can be a suitable architectural attitude? I didn't want to provide a theoretical presentation, but to show some Hungarian examples of these fields, case studies being in accordance with the way of thinking, perhaps represented in historical urban landscape. Having received the program of the conference that put me after a presentation of post-war reconstructions of historic city centers in Poland, I modified my presentation in order to give you some account of the similar issue. In Hungary, uh, had lost, <coughs> Hungary had less losses in the war than Poland, but they were severe as well. For example, Budapest has lost all the bridges on the Danube. Hungary built less copies than Poland, but if you look at the bridges of Budapest, many of them have smaller or larger parts reconstructed as copies in the post-war period. These are, for example, the Liberty Bridge on the previous slide, or the chain bridge reconstructed in the late 40s or the 50s. But the Elizabeth Bridge, this one, the white one, was the last reconstruction among the damaged bridges of Budapest Inner Park in 1964. It was built as a totally new bridge, but the structure, scale, form, and proportions are similar to the old one. These solutions can be seen in the case of buildings as well. The most characteristic examples of several ways of reconstructions can be found in the castle district of Buda. The houses, not completely destroyed, have been repaired, like this old Buda town hall, which was restored to its previous form. Uh, according to the guidebooks, this yellow or green house on the Vienna Gate Square was built in the beginning of the 19th century. The truth is something else. The house was built almost completely in 1952 as an authentic copy. The stone decoration of this house in Fortnum Street was carved after the damaged original ones, but the whole building was reconstructed after all photographs as a more or less true copy. In other cases, new buildings, at least the facades, were designed in a simple historicism this white one in the center of the picture. They can fit in the row of houses, but as a matter of fact, they are neither old nor new, being a bit boring and lifeless. 
His archaizing style was everything but sincere, and it is in connection of the, with the so-called socialist realistic style of the period. This practice ended in the middle of the, 60s, of the 50s. The new idea was to show the difference between old and new, and it worked not only in the scale of sometimes recently detected old details, but in the case of whole buildings as well. After 1956, contemporary architecture, that is modernism, was used even in historic context. The only demand was to fit into the main lines of traditional architecture, traditional volumes, to use the similar height of eaves and ridges, that means a similar pitch of roofs. Perhaps this was the first time when the word landscape was used in a case of a city, as the aim was to save the landscape of the roofs, as the Dachlandschaft, as it was called in German at that time. This small square, looking completely traditional, is an interesting example, as it consists of buildings of the last decades. Buildings were built even on ruins. The ruins part remained intact, and the brand new house was built around it. The most celebrated new house stands on the western <coughs> edge of the castle hill, built on the last years of the 50s. The facade is totally flat. The play of the openings is according, accordance with the two-story flats. There are no traditional moldings, framings, etc. Only the texture of the brick and concrete provides the traditional richness of details. Some interesting experiences were made using contemporary structures and contemporary materials. Some of them are even worse to be listed now, in spite of their becoming out of fashion. This is some heritage of the so-called socialism as well. Most of these houses were designed in a high architectural quality, but there are some unhappy facades with dark surfaces and simple schematics openings. Even the Hotel Hilton tried to fit into the surroundings of the Matthias Church. The problem is not only the use of industrialized elements, the greatest mistake is the measure of the volume, the scale of the building. The new generation of houses filling further gaps tries to cope better with these conflicts. The old ideas remained valid, but they were completed in close connection with regionalism and urban, historic urban landscape in order to create a more sensitive architecture. More and more elements of traditional architecture are considered important in the case of designing new buildings. The morphology of the surroundings, the relief of the ground, the line of the street, the size and use of the building block. It is important to take into consideration the proportions of the facade, the balance of horizontal and vertical lines. The plasticity of architectural elements must be studied as well. Details and materials are of utmost importance, but on the other hand, even urban planning and finding the best function are crucial points as well. The dwelling house in Osaka Street is interesting as the traditional harmony proportions are composed by contemporary means. The small hotel on Trinity Square is a very important element of the landscape. The mass of the building follows the form of the former disappeared building. This house used first-time architectural forms, reminding the traditional ones. But all these details were used in a transposed way, not traditionally. The most interesting example is another hotel in Fortuna Street, built on the fragments of old houses. The remaining parts have been saved, and all the new parts are of contemporary design with carefully designed details. Only one building used to stand here on two medieval plots before the Second World War. That building used to have an early 19th century simple regular facade. After the war, only small parts of the facade survived. Some fragments of a medieval porch and a row of corbels could be identified on the left part of the site. This medieval building could be imagined easily. A porch with a semicircular arch, a cantilever upper level, probably with three windows. This image was followed by the new house built by the use of the old fragments. The aim of the architect was to design a contemporary building that can remember of the history of the site. The left part is accented by a gable similar to the neighboring houses. The border of the two plots can be identified on the facade. The arch of the gate has been reconstructed and the flat, irregular blind arcade explains the role of the corpses. 
The cornice under the eave and the row of windows reminds us of the 19th century building. The original material of the house is stone. The new parts are built by brick. A special type of brick has been chosen to suit to the stone in its color and surface. In Chopron, Western Hungary, the examples of the building of the first generation are similar to those of the Buddha Castle Hill. This new building, right hand side, fits into the street as a typical facade of the late 60s. And the other one in the middle of the picture is similar, uh, and it is similar to the lost house, which uh, used to stood he stand here, with pitched roof, but uh, with a bit higher volume and a simplified facade. That very building, standing on the perimeter of the core of the old town, is much more remarkable. It has an irregular volume, the facade has a broken line on the plan, and the roof slopes toward the neighboring house as well. There is a gap at the edge of the facade, and the second floor is cantilevered. Every story has another type and size of windows, and there is no more decoration on the facade but window frames. It seems difficult to understand these details on the first side, but if you take a walk in the town, you can find all these elements on the old houses. For example, the eaves, eaves are parallel with the streets, but there are parts of roofs to other directions. The gaps between houses are typical as well, saving the independence of the buildings and the plots. Cantilevered upper stories are common in, in this town. And many of these plots follow the line of the city walls surrounding the egg-shaped plan of the settlement. And like everywhere in historic architecture, the windows of the Piano Nobile are taller than those of the ground floor or the third story. In many cases, windows and their frames are the only decorations on the facades. And if you detect all these elements, you can understand this strange new house. Of course, all these elements should be used not only in a contemporary way, but they should be transformed and interpreted with creativity and with good taste. Some remarkable new houses were built even in Page, southern Hungary, just adjacent to the World Heritage Site. The mixed function of this ensemble on the corner corresponds with the heterogeneous site. It is partly a dwelling house with flats of different types, but there is a small hotel and shops and offices as well. The house is meandering on the site plan in connection with the history pattern of the building plots and creating a pleasant sport in Cordonel. The roof consists of several parts using more or less usual traditional materials and forms. The facades follow the function of the house and the area in front of them. There are closed parts and there are courtyards as well. Uh, there are different surfaces used on the facades, but they are made out of traditional materials, stone, brick, and plaster, creating a logical but living texture. Even old local second-hand bricks of former houses of the site were used as a cladding. The house has been awarded by the International Brick Award a few years ago. I have chosen two other buildings close to the previous one as well. Both of them are designed according to the rules of being in harmony of the context. I like them especially because of the use of their windows. The first one is a simple white volume, but it has very playful window framings. This use of framings is similar to the 100 years old house on the opposite side of the street. Both houses are totally white, creating a special atmosphere of the street. The other building in the inner city has a bit irregular bulk, with the main facade being not vertical. The traditional windows must be vertical to be open, so the windows became a kind of gag on the facade. And an old version of this kind of gag can be seen on the other side of the street. Similarly to the previous example, such a small detail can give a special spice to the Stansky. Although the topic of this conference is the city, but the way of thinking, according to the historic urban landscape, can be used in rural regions and in the case of landscapes as well. For example, the region north of the Lake Balaton has an important architectural tradition that can be used in the case of new buildings. In order the morphology of the settlement, the use of the building plots is worse to be followed by new architecture. The environment is rather sensitive, and it is very easy to spoil the traditional values of the settlement. In a small village, a supermarket was planned with a usual flat box type building. 
Finally, the solution was much more satisfying, you can see in the center of the picture. The use of the traditional bark materials and openings can help not to disturb the look of the village. The supermarket deserved to be awarded by the Ecomos Prize a few years ago. <coughs> there are some other interesting examples of well-designed sensitive architecture built recently even in cultural landscape that can be a topic for other presentation. There are, for example, new wineries in the Tokai history wine region, World Heritage Site. The essence is just the same as in the previous examples. All these buildings accommodate the contemporary demands very well, and at the same time they fit into the context, save the identity of the site, and enhance the use of the place and <coughs> sensitive coexistence of all the new. All these examples show solutions of successful architectural attitude created by architects with conservators and developers being in harmony with the desires of local inhabitants and the identity of the surroundings. Returning to the city, according to our modernist ideas, the main characteristics of the new element are determined by the surroundings and the traditions, but all the other elements uh, are designed in a contemporary way. In the last years, this older principle hasn't changed, but the best examples became even more sensitive to keep more context with the historic context, taking into consideration some more characteristics, and even the spirit of the place to save the quality and identity of the environment, according to the principles of historic work and design. Thank you so much for these wonderful examples and for respecting the time. So if you have any technical questions, please ask them now. Please. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you how this compatibility with the uh, context has been achieved. I mean, normally um, regulations are not enough and um, architects would be fastidious of the past just to comply with the regulations. Or, contrast the architecture. So how this kind of compatibility, university, universal compatibility been achieved with combined with the creative you, know, you see, I have chosen good examples. <laughs> <laughs> In this situation there was a good uh, cooperation between the architect, the conservator, between the uh, building authority and so on. And uh, I can't say that is quite typical. I can show you quite horrible examples as well, but I don't like to show them. <laughs> so, well, okay. this is probably the answer to the, uh, to the very important issue. We, have, we need to somehow define who is supposed to make these things happen, not the bad things happen. <laughs> yes, you see, I used to be a conservation officer, and I always say that this is the most important. To, to have good connection with the uh, stakeholders. And in this, this case, it is possible. And of course, you need much luck as well, and much, uh, how to say, talent of the architects, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. OK. If, we have don't, if, uh, if you don't have any more technical questions, so thank you so much once more for the it is very, very interesting, intriguing uh, paper.